In this video, I'm talking with the owner and operator of Zoomies Rehab. Tune in to hear how a physical therapist can help your dog and how to find a good one in your neck of the woods. Coming up. Ian here with Simpatico Dog Training. Recently, on my weekly Facebook live show, Cyber Office Hours, I talked with Whitney Mitchell, the owner and operator of Zoomies Rehab in Sayer, Pennsylvania. If you've never heard of a physical therapist for dogs, this video will provide you with useful information. You'll learn about the role of pet physical therapists, how to locate a physical therapist for your dog near you, and how to improve communication between your PT and veterinarian if you choose to use one. Of course, Notes, links, and resources will be in the description below, along with timestamps if you'd like to revisit a particular section later on. Now, a little bit of context for you. Back in 2021, my elderly English bulldog had blown out his back and lost the use of his back legs completely. My vet suggested immediate euthanasia. Desperate, I contacted Whitney and she got some movement back into his back legs when nobody thought it was possible. Sadly, with his advanced age, there were other complications and we had to let him go. That said, I can definitely attest to the effectiveness of a knowledgeable therapist. We'll go bazoop. There we go. Hey, Whitney, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Thank you. What's Zoomies? So what's in a nutshell? What is that all about? So I'm a, a physical therapist. Um, I've been a PT for over 20 years. I was first introduced to canine rehab with my own dog probably over 15 years ago. And I knew immediately it was the coolest thing. Um, and, it, and it makes sense. Um, it works for people. It only makes sense that it works for dogs. Um, but fast forward through life and all that. I finally went back to school to get my certification to do canines in 2018, finished my certification in 2019, and started my, my progression kind of moving over from treating humans to treating primarily just dogs now. So my background's PT, and then I'm certified in canines and started that, like I said, 2019. Wow, that's, that's awesome. Kind of that started in it all. So what kind of, what kind of things uh, as a canine PT do you treat? Um, I tell people all the time, pretty much anything that you could think of that a human would need physical therapy for, a dog also can benefit from physical therapy for. Uh, sometimes we just don't think of it in the same way. So um, any injuries, obviously anything before surgery, after surgery, just arthritis, just aches and pains um, as the dogs are aging. Pretty much there's neurological issues. There's, you know, just things that happen. We get nerves that get pinched and different things like that. We start to see some neurological issues. We, you know, I treat a lot of that as well. So literally anything I always tell people, just put it in the mindset of people, anything that you would say, oh, you know, you're looking a little weak or, you know, not, not able to go up and down stairs very well, get up out of the chairs very well. I mean, anything that you would think that somebody should use PT for would be appropriate for the dogs as well. I imagine that that's, uh, eye-opening maybe conversation to have because you know people can talk about like oh yeah i got a little hitch on my get along there you know or oh it's sore when i get up in the morning or like uh you know i'm going into surgery i'm getting ready for surgery you know this and that and the other thing and of course animals are non-verbal <laughs> you know uh yeah. and they don't have aside from us anyone to advocate for them so that's probably right. a mindset it is and it's it's you know, owners know their dogs, you know, owners can usually tell like, dog just seems a little off, something doesn't seem right. They're not getting on the sofa like they used to, they're not getting in the car. Um, maybe they're just displaying some other behaviors that just seem not typical for the dog. Right. Um, and my always biggest message when I'm talking to owners or people in general, and even the veterinarians that I work with is don't wait to send them. Don't, you know, like if you're noticing something is off, like something has probably been off probably for longer than you even realize because dogs compensate so easily. Yeah. There's four limbs. They just shift weight to the other side or, you know, do whatever they, it's really hard um, to, to notice those things sometimes even early on. So the, when you're starting to notice it, likely something's been brewing for a little while. Yeah, um, right. So my message always to everybody is don't wait, don't wait until the dog can barely get up the stairs or can barely get up off of the floor. Um, to decide that maybe something else needs to be done about it. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes we can get things much better and improve things much quicker 
if we work on them before they escalate. Yeah, right. Degree. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> as with all things, you know, early yeah. intervention makes things supremely simpler to resolve Correct. successfully. Yeah, I and mean, even dogs behavior. Do, they compensate so much more than even we do. Um, so things just start to snowball. And so it ends up, you know, you're peeling back layers and layers of things that likely had been going on for quite a long time um, before we even realized it. So the yeah. sooner we can get to it, the better. Yeah. Um, and as the dogs are aging, the sooner, some of it may just be normal aging things, which is fine, which is normal, typical, same as for people. But if we can figure out and I can educate the owners early on, on things that they can do to keep their dogs moving better, to kind of minimize some of those aging things that happen, they'll age much more gracefully and they'll have so much better quality of life as they're aging. If owners know how to intervene as, as they're going. I think that's a really an interesting thing, you know, to think about because I think a lot of people don't even realize that PT is an option, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, but I went to the vet, you know, and they didn't even say I should do that. So I think I, honestly, I didn't even know until Hannah told me, uh, you <laughs> know, cause I know Hannah has been bringing uh, Makota to you for a long time. And then she was like, "Oh my gosh, uh, Winnie's great. You should take uh, you should take Dexter over there." And I was like, "Wait, what? That's a thing? What? I've That's been in animal welfare for <laughs> over a decade. Like, how is this news to me?" <laughs> I know. Well, and the thing is, is it's been around for a long time. Like I said, I brought my dog over 15 years ago, um, but I was living in New Jersey at the time, and obviously, certain areas of the country, yeah, you know, it's more known and more commonplace than it is in others. Um, sure. Certainly, in this area, you know, not as much as some of the more populated areas in the cities and things like that. So, canine rehab has been rehab has been a thing for quite a while. However, it has gained a lot more momentum, I would say, probably in the last decade. It's still not where it should be. The services, like you said, are still not known to everybody as commonplace as human PT, that it is an option for dogs. But that's why we, you know, are working so hard to encourage, you know, PTs and things like that to get into the field if they're really passionate about it, because it should be something that's as easy for people to find for their dogs it is, as it is for people to get into mm -hmm. PT. Um, and we're just not there yet. Uh, there's still a lot of education that needs to happen um, to not only the population, but also to the vets. You know, it's a learning curve to figure out how we're all going to work together and we work together as a team and, and things like that. But when right. people find out that it's an option, usually people are pretty psyched about it um, because a lot of people don't want to necessarily keep their dogs on pain meds for years and years and years if they don't have to. Maybe they don't want to have to have the dog have surgery if it's if there's another option. You know, so it, it just provides a, a nice, I always say it, it kind of is the middle ground between like, there's a dog that is in a lot of pain, not necessarily a surgical option. You know, maybe the dog's older and the surgery is not an option or for whatever reason, surgery is just not appropriate. Or there's like pain medicine, you know, and owners don't necessarily always want to do pain medicine for long periods of time. So you have these dogs that like kind of fall somewhere in the middle where really the only thing that up until now they knew they could do is use pain medicine or use any kind of medication to help alleviate any of the symptoms and then managing just managing it. It you know, just manages as they can. So I feel like the rehab kind of fills that void somewhere in the middle to help these dogs that don't necessarily need surgery, but don't necessarily want to be, it's not really in their best interest. And some dogs honestly can't even take pain medicine. You know, they have different medical issues that don't allow them to take certain kind of medications that could help them. Mm -hmm. So rehab really kind of, fills a huge gap, I feel like, um, for these animals to live Agreed. just better functional, you know, better quality, yeah. life, less pain, you know, all that. Yeah. Especially when it's like you said, it's a, it's a proactive kind of thing, uh, instead of a, a reactive kind of treatment, you know, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Which is, uh, I'm in a, on a side note, that was my experience with you and rehab was, you know, I didn't realize it was an option until right. it was too late. But I do remember, you know, not to toot your horn <laughs> too much, but I remember, you know, you did, I took Dexter to you when he was lost the use of his back legs. Yeah. And you got him to start moving his legs and the vet said that, that was going to be impossible. So I knew right then I was like, this is an, a really vastly untapped resource in, I believe, in animal welfare, at least in, yeah. in my experience, you know. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's not the first time I've heard that. There's been um, quite a few dogs that I've had come in that were told um, that the dog should be euthanized or that there's not anything that possibly could be done to give that dog the quality of life 
um, that it needed. And we were able to provide that. Not to say that's the case every time, because obviously, you know, some injuries are just too great. Not yeah. um, but like you said, it's an option for people. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's always really rewarding to have those dogs come in that say, well, they said I needed to euthanize the dog. And we're like, let's give her a go. Um, what do we have to lose? And then the dog ends up walking and doing right. fantastically. I mean, there's nothing that feels better than that. Right, right. But at that, yeah, I agreed at that point, though. It's like it's like it was for me. It was just kind of like a Hail Mary, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I keep thinking, you know, just from my own experience, what would the outcome have been like if I had been doing PT with Dexter for weeks or months or years before his injury, you know, if right. that would have even been a thing. Right, right. And that's so. the, that's where that learning curve thing comes in comes into play. You know, there's just a lot of you know educating that you know we're still working on doing you know as a as a profession you know to right. the vet world and just to the overall population to access us, look for us. There's a lot out there, but yeah, it's definitely an option. And and just like in the human world, I, you know, I tell everybody, even in the human side, you know, you have to advocate for yourself. You know, the medical world is what it is, and it can be a little bit chaotic and stuff like that. So, and it's no different in the, in the, in the dog world. So, you know, once you know, you know, have that conversation with your vet, advocate for the dog, you know, that's just the best thing that we can yeah. do kind of moving forward to keep getting the word out. Yeah. I, again, I hope I'm not filling the conversation too much with my own experience. I mean, that's all I got to go on right now, you know, but uh, <laughs> uh, when my vet suggested euthanasia, I was like, well, I'm going to try this canine me PT that everybody's been talking about. And they're like, what do you think that's going to do? So I think there's an education aspect there as well, not just with pet owners, but in the professional community, you know, of like, this is, this is a valid resource. This isn't, you know, like the car salesman on the corner <laughs> selling a hoopty, uh, you know, and you don't know. Yeah, what and just happen. roll off the street and kind of just decide like, hey, it'd be fun to kind of hang out with some dogs and, and do whatever, you know, there's. Right. right. But there's nothing, you know, nothing that speaks better than um, treating the dogs and having the results be there as proof that it works. And I. Right. I, I think that sometimes that's what it has to come down to is that some of these vets that might be, I mean, I, I'm super fortunate. I work with really incredible vets that love what I do and see the value in it. But then I think there's others that are a little bit not sure. And I think the only way sometimes to get them to understand that it can be helpful is to show them how it works. So, you know, you always hope, and I always get excited if I do get a referral from somebody maybe that, um, I don't get much referrals from, and I'm always super happy to have them go back to the vet and show them how much better they're doing and have them be surprised. Right. The proof is in the pudding. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I think that that's sometimes the only way you'll get some people to really see that value. I mean, I can tell them all I want, um, <laughs> but I think sometimes right. they're not going to always believe me until they actually see it. So I always try to take those, you know, cases and really, you know, hope that they make an impact in that way too. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm going to pop up here Hannah's comment. She pi piped up. Uh, <laughs> I can speak from solid personal experience here. My dog came to wit barely able to get up or walk up without pain. She was 11 at the time and struggling with muscular issues, scar tissue, osteoarthritis from multiple surgeries, atrophy. She's 13 now and she gets around so well and she's so happy. And I can attest to that. Like Coda is, I love her. She's such a sassy little putz. She um, really is. <laughs> us as you, me, uh, Wit and I know, uh, and this is, I think, a really salient point here. Uh, we also see pain mediated behavioral issues all the time. And oftentimes people don't see it. Uh, I really hope that wonderful folks like Whitney become more commonplace. Um, and so from a behaviorally standpoint, you know, I mean, I'm trainer, behavioral consultant, and, and Hannah as well. And if you look at uh, the humane hierarchy, which is kind of like that skeleton that we use to treat from a clinical standpoint, behavioral issues, very top of the list before you even talk about training, training is like halfway down the friggin' list for crying out loud. Very, very, very top is medical you know right. like are there medical issues pain mediated issues mobility issues things that are impelling those behaviors that we're calling behavior problems and if you can resolve those things or at least 
provide some, you know, release of the tension those things are causing. Mm -hmm. Many times you're really getting to the heart of those behavior issues, you know. Sure. My longtime viewers always know, I always say, fix the well, not the sink, you know. And yes. that's, uh, I, I think that what you're doing there is a, is a tremendously impactful part of that, of that approach, that humane hierarchy. Yeah. Well, like we said, they compensate so easily. So sometimes, like you said, they don't notice maybe that they're not quite moving well or there's something else that's creating pain. You know, sometimes we just miss those subtleties, those those cues. But, you know, I mean, it makes sense. We all get a little cranky, you know, if we're in pain. And absolutely, you know, so I mean, it makes sense, you know, that that would impact their behavior overall some dogs obviously more than others um yeah right 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 i mean there's so many genetics temperament environment all those things play into those sure. Yeah, sure. yeah sure sure yeah and yeah. we've had lots of well I, I don't know i shouldn't say lots but several cases in our case files even where you know we were like mm, i don't know i'm not a vet but and we just pushed and pushed and pushed and and sure enough there's undiagnosed problems there that you know everybody's like oh <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. And it's a different mindset. I still, I have people, you know, understandably because the dogs can't talk, but they'll come in and the dog may be limping and the owner's like, yeah, but I don't think they're in any pain. They don't act like they're in pain. And I'm always like, well, but if they were in pain, they, you know, they would be using the limb, you know what right. I mean? Better right. than they are. They're, they're just better at hiding it. They don't have the same emotional sort of responses that we do to pain. So they'll figure it out. They may not yelp and cry that they're in pain. Normally they, they say that by the time they express that kind of level of pain where they're actually showing pain and crying, they're at like an eight out of 10 pain. Yeah. Right. So if they're walking around not using the leg well, I mean, chances are they're not comfortable or, or they would use it, but it is yeah. a common thing that I hear. So if things are so subtle that where I'm, you're not even seeing a subtle or a, an obvious limp, you know, to where you guys are noticing some things, you know, um, Clearly, people are not really understanding that their dog might be in pain. You know, they're just we're just missing it. You know. Sure. Now, uh, speaking of that, you know, professional key collegiality and stuff like that, and the network. A question I think probably gets asked a lot is: Does somebody need to see their vet to see you beforehand, or do they have to have a referral or something like that? Yes. So yes to both. The dog needs to be cleared medically to make sure that PT is appropriate. Um, or the rehab is appropriate. So a medical clearance, making sure there's nothing else going on that would make PT not be um, a, a valid intervention at that point would be necessary. And then once the, the vet is ensured that everything looks okay, um, they do send me then a referral so that I know what I'm treating. They've kind of come up with maybe a loose diagnosis on maybe what's going on. Um, and, and giving essentially permission um, and clearance for the dog to then come to see me. So yes, I do require that medical clearance and that referral slash permission from their vet to come in and be evaluated and treated by me. Yeah. So it's not really any different than in the human world. You know, the human world, you go to the doctor, you know, my shoulder is bothering me, like, let's do some PT. They write out the referral, send it over. And, and it's not really anything different than I've ever done in healthcare in general for people. Mm -hmm. It's, it's treated as the same right. it's um, a similar process. medical intervention. Yep. And so they get cleared um, and then they come see me, but I do have people reach out and ask, you know, do I, you know, can I just come see you? Um, sometimes I can get in touch with the vet. I have some really good working relationships with the vets uh, local that if they've seen the vet within the last couple of months and the vet's sort of aware that maybe it's just some arthritis, you know, maybe like they've noticed the dog slow down, the dog's aware that, or the vet's aware that the dog has some arthritis, has seen them within the last couple of months. Sometimes they can reach out directly to the vet's office and say, um, I know you're aware, um, they've contacted me, would you have a problem with me seeing them? And most often they say, no, sounds great, I'll send over the referral. But if it's been a time since, you know, if they hadn't seen them since their well visit the prior year, likely the vet's gonna say, let me have them come in. Let's check things out again. Let's just make sure we're not missing anything else medically. And then also if the dog's in a decent amount of discomfort, some meds on board might not be a bad idea because certainly just like, you know, it would be more tolerable to do rehab if they have something on board to help maybe with the pain. So, yep. you know, we're working together as a team to kind of, you know, it's like a yep. healthcare kind of team together, um, you know, and so I, I send reports back 
you know, something's going on and things don't look quite right or they don't seem to be responding or maybe they're doing fantastic. Either way, I send updates, you know, so that the vets know mm -hmm. um, if their pain or their medication doesn't look like it's helping. You know, I can always reach out to them. They can kind of switch things up. So we work together. And yeah, that's, that's exactly the way we do it from the behavioral side. You know, a lot of times there's dogs with severe behavioral distress, you know, and we exactly like you said, have to work with the vet and say, hey, mm -hmm. we got some behavioral mod going on but we need some psychopharmaceuticals you know to sure. kind of get our foot in the door to help make these inroads a lot more possible and right and that's exactly you know same as you described say hey reporting back to the vet these are working or or our observations are kind of that it's not working well enough or you know right. there's contraindications or you know whatever i mean that really just puts everybody in you know it's best interest for everybody you know i mean there's nothing better than just having you know as a pet owner even for myself there's nothing better than surrounding yourself with people that you trust and that you know we're talking and working together and everybody's working in the best interest you know of the dog you know i just think that's best case scenario for everyone you know yeah a couple of questions if you're hip to it sure story by Margaret. Uh, my sister's elderly pup had a torn ACL and was able to heal with PT and water therapy. It took time, but she was able to not have to have surgery. She's a smaller dog. Excellent. Awesome. Yeah, that's uh, awesome when we can, you know, make that happen. Yeah, you got a lot of high tech stuff too at your facility, which is really cool. I mean, you've got like the, you know, I, I know you've got like the ramps and the and the, mm -hmm. the massage tools and the cones and stuff. But I mean, you've got some other pretty high tech stuff there too. Yeah, I mean, I use the laser. Um, the laser, I always equate, it's it's quicker, but if anybody's had human PT, you know, we use, you know, like an ultrasound or, um, and I do have a TENS unit, like an electric steam unit that we can use, but it's the right kind of dog to be able to sit still for that for an extended <laughs> right. time. But, you know, I mean, I have a really good laser that I use to help with pain and inflammation and things like that. That's usually quite helpful, um, you know, in, in that regard. Um, I don't have water therapy. I don't know if I will have, you know, maybe down the line, I, I could see doing that, but coming from the human side, I've relied always so much on my hands to tell me so much and to help facilitate things that I tend to really focus on a lot of hands-on things. Cause I think that's where the benefit really lies. I mean, anybody can really buy like a water treadmill and, you know, like a really good laser and you know, and do that and say like they did rehab and, you know, they have their benefits for sure. But I think it's a whole nother thing when people can put their hands on the dog and be able to help facilitate things in that different way. I think that's where the skill comes in more so. And I, I think that's where you actually see better outcome. Mm -hmm. So potentially down the line, I could see doing water. I do have had a, I've had a handful of cases that I kind of thought, oh, water might be helpful. You know, mostly those neuro dogs that just can't really walk very well, you know, at all, can't wait very much at all. Um, I could see water being helpful until they're able to transition to land. But ultimately, we we function on the land. Um, so it's great to be able to be in the water, but ultimately we have to be able to function on, on land. So mm -hmm. um, I do focus mostly there. But yeah, I have a lot of different exercise equipment. You know, it's a lot of creativity is what it comes down to, just being super creative. Um, and making it fun for the dogs because like they don't understand, you know, it's not like, you know, when you're working with people, you can say, okay, let's like do three sets of 12, you know, of that exercise, you know, <laughs> just like, where's my treat and <laughs> right. we do and, you know, so you, 12? To, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so you have to be like really strategic on, okay, I need to work these muscles. How are we going to make work these muscles? Um, but also make it fun for the dog, you know? So it's just, sometimes it's just about being super creative with a couple of things that you have, but, um, but yeah, so we make it work. Yeah. 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 So, uh, that's an interesting proposition too, you know, is getting buy-in and participation from the dogs. Mm. Uh, you probably have to have, uh, a few skills in your back pocket to be able to pull out for that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's lots of treats usually is what it comes down to. I have a few, I've had a few dogs, but very few that have not been food motivated at all. Some of them are just really motivated by a ton of praise. Um, so, you know, the owners and I usually like get completely exhausted by just telling them, you know, with our real excited voices, how good they're doing and they get super excited and they participate. Some of those dogs, we just need to kind of keep leashed so that we can keep them focused on what we need to do. Um, but yeah, other dogs that are food motivated, I mean, I have cheese, we have peanut butter. I get really, sure. really good high value treats, um, locally so that, 
uh, you know, we keep them engaged in that way. So yeah. treats are treats are huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about for the uh, for the owners? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. As far as what the uh, look, you getting a follow through. That's always a struggle. That's with hard. It's like, do your homework. <laughs> yeah, that you know, that's hard. It, it's hard no matter what. It was always hard getting people to be compliant with their own home exercise program for themselves, you know, for whatever <laughs> I mean, the compliance at home is huge, um, but it is challenging. So when I, you know, to have people have a difficult time staying compliant with their own home exercise program for like their own health. Sure. Um, yeah. Not everybody is super motivated to set aside that time to do the exercises for their dogs. Right. Um, which I get, you know, life is, life is busy. Life is crazy. I try to make it super easy when I'm, you know, if you're going to take your dog for a walk, we figure out how to, you know, engage, incorporate some of those exercises in just your walks. It's like, you're already going for the walk. Right. So do this, 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 sometimes some of the cueing and some of the weight shifting stuff that we might do for a back end. If they have a dog that eats at the food bowl and doesn't care, you know, if they're touching them and stuff like that, mm -hmm. sometimes the owners will do a little tactile stuff with them while they're eating. Cause they're so focused on eating and all that, mm -hmm. that they can stimulate some of those things while they're standing still there so we ch i try to make it simple some owners are incredibly amazing at you know doing the exercises at home but ultimately dogs bounce back pretty well they're pretty resilient so even if owners are only doing like half of the stuff half of the time um in combination with what we're doing we usually get there sometimes it just takes a little longer if mm -hmm. there's not as much follow through at home you know it just yeah. takes a little longer maybe to get there so. <laughs> that is that is my experience as well yeah <laughs> So there's a couple more questions for you here. Uh, this is a big one. Uh, the water tank treadmill did wonders for my last bull mastiff. Sheila asked, uh, mm -hmm. could Whitney comment on preventative? Mm -hmm. I can play fun running games outside in summer with my 25 pound Frenchie, but on these winter days, we're stuck inside with a small house and wooden floors. Mm -hmm. I know I'm a worrier, but I've been avoiding any running or chase games as he just slips all over and I don't want to cause problems. Thanks. Yeah. It, winter's hard. Winter is really hard to keep dogs engaged, you know, even when they're, you know, healthy or not healthy, that kind of thing. But so my tip always for people with slippery floors at home, if they don't mind putting them down and it's not a trip hazard for any person in the house is yoga mats. Um, yoga mats are super easy. You can tape them together. You can make like a runway if there's a certain pathway that the dog likes to move through. Um, I've had people get a couple of them and just put them together and tape them together and just, it creates just like a runway, you know, maybe from the living room into the kitchen or whatever for the dogs. They're easy to just pull up. They're easy to clean off and they're inexpensive. You know, a lot of carpet run, it's carpets get expensive and they get dirty and messy and it's, you know, you have to make sure they're not sliding on the floor either. You know, yoga mats really stick nicely. So you could always put those out to do a little bit of exercise and like fun, like chasing running kind of stuff in the house. You could always just pull those out for when it's playtime um, just to avoid that slipping. But if they're slipping, even just kind of playing, you know, with the other dog in the house or just in general walking through the house, you can leave them down. That's always my biggest tip for slipping. Um, but there are a lot of other fun games. There's, you know, there's a lot of different things. You know, you can get those cavalettis, like the poles. They, they can, you know, walk and step in over those, you know, circle around things. I get those licky, I use licky mats a lot and put those on like a solid surface and they can lick on that. And, you know, there's exercises that you can do in that way too, to get them engaged. So there's a lot of different cool things that you can do exercise wise that actually tires, it might not seem a whole lot physically, um, but because they have to engage their brain mentally so much too, to do the exercise and to do it in the way that you want them to do it, it actually fatigues them out quite, quite well. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And so when I do have dogs coming to rehab in the winter, especially dogs that are going to be post-op or dogs that have to be rested quite a bit for whatever reason, and the owners are going crazy because the dogs have so much energy and they've been so pent up and, and all that. It's not, actually the, the rehab works out nice because it can give them exercises to do. So my best recommendation, because I don't know exactly what things would be beneficial for this specific dog is to, if he did do the water treadmill um, and, and she knows somebody that you can go back to that person and maybe just give them an exercise program, certain exercises that they can do safely in the home. I would, definitely recommend that it might just be if especially if it's preventative 
you know, you can just pop back in for a visit and just be like, you know, let me know what I can do, you know, in the house exercise wise, that would be appropriate for that dog. It, it'll, it'll be good. Uh, and I, you, you're a hundred percent right on that. I've, I've said that multiple, <laughs> multiple times that mental often counts for as much as physical, you know, if you're putting them together, right, you can mm -hmm. wipe a dog out with, <laughs> it doesn't have to all be gym class. It can be math class too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they don't have to be outside running laps around the yard. I mean, I have a dog in here and we do, you know, not high energy exercises, activities for maybe the half, you know, half of the session and for like a half hour or so. And the owner will be like, well, that dog was wiped after that session, <laughs> went home and slept the rest of the afternoon. And, you know, right. it could be a younger high energy dog and that half hour of having to focus and, and do the exercise right and slow things down when they're used to going fast. Sometimes dogs that want to go 100 miles an hour, just having them slow down to do some slower movements is hard for them because they really have to think about what they're doing with their body and it wipes them out, tires them yeah. out, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, I would always recommend, you know, checking in with everybody. I mean, we treat issues, but preventative prevention has always been something we've done. Um, and I highly recommend any you know, anybody that has a dog that may be prone to an injury or maybe has already recovered from an injury and you want to just make sure that they stay healing well, check in with somebody that is near you that can help give you some things. You know, that's my biggest thing is, is owner education on what you should be doing um, long term to pre prevent things. And I do have owners that are like, I don't know if I'm going to do that right. So, you know, I have owners that whose dogs I've treated and now they come once a month just to check in you know, and to have me do some massage, get some really good stretching, make sure we're, we're not missing things that might be building up that they're not realizing. So we kind of do like a once over, we go through exercises and I teach them new exercises and we just kind of stay on top of them to make sure that mm -hmm. stuff doesn't progress or that they, that's more of my preventative kind of um, appointments. And dogs, I think, tend to buy into those things the more they do them anyway and find, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. They, they, love out of it. It. they love it to do it. You know, they get excited. Yeah. Owners are like, yeah, I pull out the mats and they know it's time that we're going to do those exercises and they get super excited. Um, right, right. Good. And I think it creates a nice relationship kind of, it, it creates a nice bond too with the owner and the, and the dog too. It just gives them some Absolutely. another way to engage with them um, in a positive way. So I've had that, um, that response as well, that people have come back and been like, yeah, you know, it's just been a nice time for us to spend together. A hundred percent. Janet asks, uh, what type of PT can help a four-year-old German Shepherd with severe bilateral hip dysplasia before and after a total hip replacement? Jiminy Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, uh, and it looks like a secondary question. Do you work with any certified animal chiropractors? Um, I do know some um, chiropractors. Um, some of them are vets. Some of them are chiropractor background trained. So yes, I do know a few. There's not, again, in this area, it's, it's a little bit harder uh, to find some of these specialties um, for the animals. So, I mean, hip dysplasia is something that we treat a lot. I don't know if the dogs had any other treatment in the past or any rehab in the past, um, or I mean, yeah, the hip replacements sometimes are necessary and they usually recover right really quite well after. So basically the type of PT that you would do, I'm, mean, you know, again, it's, you know, specifically obviously is hard because everything is so specific to that animal and how that animal right. is moving, but it's right. a lot of strength kind of stability work. So it's less, um, a lot of times movement based and more static kind of stability based. Cause essentially what it is, is that the, the hip joints are unstable. Um, and so we try to overcompensate and further stabilize it with muscle strength in those, in the hips. Um, and often because the hip dysplasia can be uncomfortable, what happens is the dog shift more weight forward. And, you know, of course, the longer and the more chronic nature it is, the more they have learned to just use their front limbs more. So oftentimes they end up more developed in the front end and they've just learned to just like the back legs are just along for the ride. Um, you know, they'll just kind of come along. And so what happens is then they atrophy more and get weaker which only makes them a little more unstable. Um, essentially, it's just kind of a vicious cycle. So making sure the dog has good, you know, control of for pain, you know, and then it is just getting the dog to learn to shift some more weight back and building up as much strength around the hips as possible. I always recommend doing some rehab before surgery, if possible, because 
generally speaking, the better shape you are going into a surgery that afterwards you're going to be down for a little bit, you're going to get atrophied and things like that, the stronger or more developed your muscles are going in, you, the better you're going to recover coming out. If, if they're already going in really weak and atrophied, when they come out, they're going to just atrophy that much more. It's just going to be, you're starting at just such a low, much lower level. Um, if you can help build up their strength a little bit more, even if they atrophy some, they're still better starting from here than down low, you know, because um, it's just bottoms out more. Yeah. So I always say if they can, you know, have some good pain control and you can get some strengthening going, the better they are, they're going in, the better they're going to be coming out for sure. They'll just recover that much quicker. Build a little bit of resilience in beforehand. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. Megan. Asks, uh, do you have any thoughts or experience with dogs that present with east-west paws? Um, I have not. I have not treated that. Um, that has not been something that I've treated before. I'm not even exactly sure yeah. <laughs> what that is. That, is it? I know sometimes there's some different ways that people refer to different conditions. Is it, and I'm always used to the more medical kind of, I guess, is it for the back end? Is it for the back legs? Is it when they kind of turn, the back paws turn out or that might duck footed or pigeon toed i don't know yeah and like you know sometimes they call that like the cow hawk position in the back where like the, the back paws are really turned out and that the heels are almost touching help answer see, that a little we'll see if we get a follow up there okay. yeah janet popped in and uh, added front paws turning out the front paws turning out yeah so i'm not sure if that's sometimes it's congenital sometimes it's just the way you know I, i'm not sure the dog specific you know case because sometimes it's congenital it's just the way the bones have formed sometimes it's it is some muscle things are compensating for you know they're compensating for either balance or instability or pain you know sometimes there's you know some shoulder weakness and so they do that and kind of do that to to compensate and to stabilize often it's a compensation pattern so um it's yeah figuring out kind of what the the core of the problem is yeah. you know it's genetic and it's just the way unfortunately like a deformity of the of the bones that the dog was born with that's kind of just where unfortunately where the dog's out not that you can't stabilize a little bit better and they have some really great you know bracing that you can get um like soft bracing wraps and things to help uh support some of those joints that may have a little bit of deformity just to minimize the stress on them as they're aging but then yes it, it is the idea then too of somebody would have to look at that dog kind of as a whole to figure out where it's compensating yeah. um what muscles do we really need to work on and how can we basically work to minimize the stress and the progression of that condition again something like that if they're noticed as a puppy you know and it's the way the dog's growing sometimes that intervention early on can help prevent that from getting too far gone. You know what I mean? As the dog is still growing, sometimes we can do certain things to make sure that that deformity doesn't continue to grow much worse. But yeah, then it just comes down to figuring out where the compensation is, figuring out where the weakness is, and then kind of addressing it from that perspective. And then just helping to support it any way you can, um, if need be, with some bracing and things like that. Both Janet and Megan piped up uh, with some extra stuff, but I think you actually answered <laughs> everything that they mentioned there. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Yeah, yeah, you definitely. Uh, I'll just put Megan said that the uh, medical term is carpal valgus. Yeah. Uh, it looks like their yeah. front legs are turned out to 10 and 2. Mm -hmm. 10 and 2 isn't terrible. I mean, every even people have like a certain amount of toe out, like on our feet. You know, some people are real straight. Like you said, some are pigeon toed. And all of us have a certain amount of just light turn out um obviously some more than others yes so if it's genetic i mean 10 and 2 isn't terrible depending on how old the dog is sometimes it's not a bad idea to intervene again one of those things like we were talking about intervening sooner rather than later you know that deformity could that get worse as as time goes on i mean potentially but sometimes it's more of the fact that over time just because it's not normal, it puts stress on other joints. So then you just see a little bit of a breakdown up the chain a little bit, um, you know, elbows and, and shoulders and things like that. So it's sometimes it's nice to intervene early. Somebody can show how to do some massage work, how to do some stretching work to minimize um, things from kind of snowballing um, from compensation patterns. And then there's always things that you can do to strengthen and then always things that you can do to help support if, you know, the joint looks like it's breaking down a little bit. You need just a little something extra support wise. I always encourage, again, like I said before, you know, intervene sooner rather than later, because, you know, when like when things are too far gone, it's sometimes really hard 
to get them feeling better. So if you can kind of figure out things right up front and kind of how to manage it along the way, you know, it's, it's much easier. And I think that people feel more empowered to know that they know what to do to help the pets. Like, Oh, they look like they're sore today. Okay. I better do some more stretching or do this. You know, it, I don't know. I know I would always feel better knowing that I had something to do to help my dog, you know, than to um, just be like, Oh, I don't know what to do. They're not moving good. They look like they're hurting. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh. Right. Yeah. The, I mean, like you said, that definitely speaks to being proactive about stuff. You know, yeah. uh, if you see something, say something. Correct. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was the rest of the questions. It was just a follow-up by Sheila on her previous statement uh, that she does tons of obedience and tricks, training every day, which is good. Good. I would, from the behavioral standpoint, I'd really look at. I would really look at uh, like enrichment pieces that engage the brain in ways other than the. I've always kind of called it the front loading versus the back loading. You know, <laughs> like if you're front loading, that's like I'm interacting with you in kind of a ventral state, you know, like obedience tricks, I'm giving you prompts and directions and you're thinking about it and doing like, that's great stuff. Mm -hmm. Then the back end of it is when you do like the en enrichment pieces where you're really less feeding the dog instructions or prompts, you're just providing affordances for the dog to do natural things that provide that mental component. There's a lot of built-in reinforcement and stuff like that. And they still have to think a lot. Like if you're having them forage or search or, you know, like you said, Whitney, some of these kind of low gear activities, like there's still a lot happening. There's still a lot of CPU processing power, you know? Yeah. And think about if you have too many tabs open on your browser, how hot does your laptop get? You know, it's working hard. <laughs> yeah. For sure, for sure. Um, and I see she said about chasing the soccer ball. I, I can understand that. So there's a lot of different tricks that somebody, you know, a, a certified person should be able to tell. But one of the, I always tell people, it's okay for them to do it. The biggest thing is to not let them chase like a, a live ball, you know, is kind of, you know, work in your training, your obedience training, sit and stay, throw the ball and then release them to go get it when it's dead so that they're not getting quite as much twisting, turning, jarring. It's more of a controlled yeah, kind of- Yeah, it's where you get the directional changes is where the most stress hits the joints. Correct. Yeah, that's where we see a lot of injuries by, you know, and again, it, it, there's a lot of strengthening that can be done in the front limbs too, to help them be able to absorb um, some of that so that they can still do the things they love to do, but in a more safe and controlled way. Yeah. Um, so well, somebody... that's like any athlete preparing for their sport too. You don't right. just, you don't just go out and start playing football or hockey or, you know, without preparing your body for the kind of things it's going to do. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So there's a lot of different ways. Cause I know there's a lot of people are like, you know, the dog just lives to do this. Well, okay, let's figure out how the dog can still do that. You know, because that's what the dog loves to do. You don't want to take that away from them, but let's figure out how maybe we can modify it, make it safer for them. Right. Um, or you know, they your muscles are only as strong in the way that you, they only get strong in the way that you train them. So if that's the activity that they like to do, well, then we will train the muscles to work and get strong in that manner for that activity, so that they can right. maybe do it a little safer. Yeah. Right. Now to piggyback off of that too, I, I I have talked if you guys that watching think about. I've talked about the concept too of taking games like tug or fetch and then developing them farther. And that's how you build in a lot of that mental component. Because if you just like, let's just take fetch, right? For example, chasing the soccer ball or, you know, people at the park with the chuck at throwing it for their border collie or their German shepherd or whatever the heck it is. Mm -hmm. It becomes kind of a mindless activity where you just, you throw it really far, they sprint and get it, they pick it up, they bring it back, and you just lather, rinse, repeat. And I've always advocated for kick that up a notch. Like, do the kind of stuff with your dog that, like, the gun dog people do, right? So teach, like, your delays and your denials and stuff. Like you said, Whitney, like, like let's teach you a position. I'm going to huck it, and then I'll send you after it. And so now there's a mental component there. Or I'm going to put you in a sit-stay. I'm going to huck it. I'm going to pitch it into cover and then I'll send you after it. And now not only do you have to wait for it, but now you have to search for it. I mean, that's, you can take these things and you can develop those games and you can add some more dimension to them. Sure. That builds not only a better behaved dog, but a more satisfied dog because you've made it, you've elevated that activity into something that's much more 
uh, cerebral and ultimately satisfying for them. And then, you know, like you said, for the safety part, you're like, well, now they're chasing a dead ball instead of a live ball. That's yeah. better for their joints. You know? Correct. Yep. No, I agree for sure. Um, and that's how like, you know, when people say I could throw the ball for them forever and they never get tired and then, you know, they'll come and they'll do a half hour with some, you know, some of the exercises that we do here, which is obviously not as physically demanding, but and then they're white. Just yeah. white. So yeah, there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, so if you're really, if you're going to see somebody that's, that's qualified um, to do so, uh, they should be able to really give you some great ideas on how to keep the dog safe, yeah. minimize, you know, injury, all the preventative things. Yeah. Um, and I will always advocate for prevention over everything. I always, sure. I always get, you know, heavy hearted when people come in and the dog is like, can barely get in my door. And I'm like, why, why we wait so long to send this dog to me? Right. Um, yeah. And then, you know, rightfully so, you know, owners want to see progress right away. And sometimes then it, it's, hard because you know two sessions isn't going to make the dog better <laughs> i heard that <laughs> down like this and of course i would love to just be able to like wave my magic wand and be like look they can get up now but um the reality is is the the farther gone they are the longer and some people just don't want to invest the the time and and the money into um how long it might take to get them back so Same with behavior Same yeah with behavior. So i'm like please don't wait um yeah. but you know, it's all comes down to education. So we just keep hammering away. Right. At that. right. Yeah. And so. I feel like that's, you know, like the discussion we just had is a really neat extension of that discussion we had earlier where, you know, where there's the intersection professionally between your PT and your vet. And then now you kind of work that trifecta in there, your PT, your vet and your trainer, Correct. you know, and then where the PT expert is saying like, Hey, your dog still needs some exercise and some mental stimulation, low impact. Here are some ideas. Uh, and that's a good place to start. If you need more, talk to your trainer behaviorist, you know? Uh, yeah. and then if the trainer behaviorist is, we kind of work back and forth together. Absolutely. No, and that's what, yeah. Having a good team that you trust is the, you know, exactly. the best thing to do for sure. Yeah, Like you said, just like the people, you know, like I've got to talk to my, GP, I got to talk to my urologist. I got to talk to my, you know, osteo, uh, os bone doctor. I couldn't even think of it right now. I'm having a brain fart. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And we're, I mean, where I used to, to work too. I mean, there was a gym attached to it. So we'd get the personal train, you know, the trainers come over and be like, you know, I'm working with so-and-so and they're having pain when they're doing this. Can you take a look at them? You know, so it's, you know, and then, yeah, I think they need some PT. I think this, this, this might be going on. They got to get, you know, let's get them to the doctor, get it checked out, get them in for PT. And then once right. they're in PT, then we talk to the trainer about what modifications they might need to do. You know, it's, I think it's just the my, the shift in, in mindset of understanding that really it's not that much different than what we're doing with people. And I, right. and, and I mean, honestly, when I started and my vet, my surgeon told me to bring my lab to PT. And I was like, I'm a PT. What are you talking about? Bring the dog to a PT. Like didn't even know it was a thing. And of course the, the things that were going on with the dog, I knew, I knew cause I did it with people, but yeah. I just, for some reason did not transition that same mindset to the dog for whatever yeah. reason. So yeah. I, I think that the shift is coming. I think more and more people are understanding that, you know, when it comes to how a body works, whether it's a person or a dog, I mean, it's, it's not all that different. Ultimately. Right. And the brain and the nervous system, like the continuity, there's so much continuity. I, I can't, Correct. so many times I've had, even just last month, people come in, they're like, my dog, these are the problems we're having. We start discussing and untangling the problems, you know, and they're just standing there wide eyed. And I, and I stop and I'm like, okay, what? And they're like, we have been taking our two daughters to a counselor for the last couple of years and they have said the exact same things. It's like the light bulb. Goes on yeah. And like, right. Oh, that makes so much sense. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. And so when I went through my certification, it was really one of those things where I'm like, it's, it was really no different than people, you know, yeah. and, and anatomically there's so many way more similarities than, than differences. Um, yeah muscles, joints, tendons. I mean, it all heals the same. It all functions, you know, the same, um, all the things I went to school for as a PT, all the same principles apply, you know, yeah. but, um, it's just a shift in the mindset. And I, I think that 
the overall we're getting there, you know, that people are starting to, you know, come around to understanding that. But um, I th think we still have a little ways to go. Absolutely. It's an ongoing process. Yeah. yeah. So on that note, uh, Margaret asked, are there certain credentials we should look for when we're searching for a pet PT? Yes. So there are, it can be a little confusing for sure. I can, when we're done here, I can always in the comments um, attach a link that has a whole database of people that are certified, no matter where you live. So I can always attach that. And then if people are looking for somebody in their area, um, they can click on that link and find somebody that's in the area that's certified. So um, there are two different schools right now that offer certifications in canine rehab. Um, so you will see often see the initial CCRT, which is a certified canine rehabilitation therapist, which is what mine is. And then there's a CCRP, which is um, a certified canine rehabilitation practitioner or something like that. So it's just a different school. So generally you want to see those credentials after the, um, after that, those, um, and then see who you're seeing, you know, like there's some, uh, vets office, some vets will get certified and, um, they will, um, you know, the vet techs will do the work. They're certified, mm -hmm. but the vet tech will do the work. I think that you, if it was me, I would want the person that's certified doing the work you know, somebody that knows, you know, knows the certification. Um, and then there's a lot of PTs, you know, that are out there that are certified. And, you know, I mean, I'm biased because my P my background is PT, but I mean, we've, we've gone to school for, you know, masters and doctorates and all that in rehab and in PT. So I just feel like we have a really strong foundation. So yes, you can do PTs. There's a lot of vets that are also certified that are fantastic. I mean, I know a lot of vets that do rehab and I've dedicated tons of time and in, in learning and are phenomenal. You kind of just have to see who you're going to see. I would ideally want to see the person that's certified. So that CCRT, CCRP are generally the initials you're going to see after. Um, CCRT so or CCRP. Yeah. So, and then, like I said, I will get that link. Um, that way, if anybody's like curious and is like, hmm, actually, I want to maybe see, find somebody near yeah, me. Yeah, you can actually uh, just pop that in the comments whenever you have a chance. Yeah, yep. I'll do um, that. And then that way, it's easy to find and then take some of the guesswork on out of it. Because there are, there are places, like I said, that will buy a laser and buy a water treadmill. They're not necessarily certified in anything, but they'll offer um, water treadmill services um, and offer laser sessions. And, and not necessarily be certified. And I guess it just depends on what your, what your ultimate goal is, but that, that wouldn't be my first choice for anybody. You know, I, I don't think that that's, you know, I always tell people, you know, when they would come to see me at PT, you know, they wouldn't come just to see me for me to do an ultrasound and then send them home. Like what that people would leave and be like, that's it. That, that's all I'm getting. Um, so sometimes I equate that with like, just get, getting just a laser session without anything else. Um, it can help with the pain and inflammation, but it's not getting to the core of the problem. It's not fixing anything. It's making the dog maybe more comfortable. Right. Um, but so that would be just my only, um, my only kind of red flag a little bit is like, just know who you're seeing. Ultimately you want to see somebody that's certified and not somebody that just kind of got some of the fancy equipment and, you know, says we offer rehab because I'm not sure you're going to get out of it. What, what you're hoping to. Right won't so. dive deeply enough into the, the long term. Correct. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's not good. Like I said, I would never have somebody, people would think that was a ripoff if they came to see me and all I did was like, oh, hi. Oh, you're here for your shoulder. Okay, we'll do a little ultrasound or do a little tens or something. Okay. And then, all right, we'll see you next time. Like, that, it seems like we're missing a few things, you know? So I was just, don't settle for that for the dogs. I know it's, it's, it's hard because I think that in the, the world of canine rehab, it's become very synonymous with a laser and a water treadmill, but there's so much more to it to really get the most benefit out of it. Yeah. Well, and I think to your point, what you said earlier too, about how you prefer to be hands-on, like it's not about having the equipment. It's about the, you know, the years of dedicated study that you've put into building up the sensitivity mm -hmm. to even know how to apply that kind of touch and then to understand the feedback you're getting back from mm -hmm. the animal as you're touching them. Yes. That's not something that, you know, I mean, shit, I could just buy a laser and 
I mean, like, hmm, yeah, I'll, well, that hip sound, huh? Yeah, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, right. you know? Right. Well, and and that's and that's what happens sometimes, unfortunately. But I, I think it's coming around. There's more and more people that are, are are getting in the field that are really passionate about it and really doing some great work. And you know, we are. It's all our hopes, obviously, that you know, doing rehab and finding somebody that's certified near you know is very commonplace and easy to find. People shouldn't have to track it down ultimately. You know what I mean? It just should right, be something right. as, you know, right. simple and commonplace as anything else. Um, right. So I think we're getting there, but you know, steps along the way. Yeah, so right. yeah, I'll attach that link below and then hopefully that'll help people. Sure. Sure. Um, so uh, I don't, I, you've generously donated an hour for us. I don't want to keep you any longer. I'm sure you're busy like we are. So uh, gosh, thank you for, for joining me today, Whitney. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I think people so got a lot out of me. it. Absolutely. I having me Absolutely. on, of course. Good and, to see uh, you. We'll continue getting the word out to everybody. Appreciate it. Same back awesome. to you. Appreciate awesome. all you guys do as well. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Stay warm and stay well, everybody. Thanks again, Whitney. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. I hope this information will provide you with alternative options for the health and longevity of your dog. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe to the Simpatico channel. Also, don't forget to join me on Fridays at noon Eastern time on our Facebook page for Cyber Office Hours, where I offer free content and live Q&A. In the meantime, keep learning, keep practicing, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.